my view is now that brain trust is really a player that is going to be a more efficient staffing solution that provides transparency to both sides of the market. When you're inventing the future of work, sometimes it pays to look at the past, even the very recent past. Recently, I had the chance to chat with a Harvard professor about new models of work, what COVID has done to jobs, and how he sees brain trust. Christopher Stanton is the Marvin Bauer Associate Professor at Harvard Business School, where he focuses on entrepreneurship, labor economics, and the future of work. And he recently wrote a paper on Brain Trust's new vision for jobs, work, innovation, and maybe even the future of corporations. I've been interested in this for a long time, and my interests really stemmed from a conversation that I had in graduate school at Stanford, where one of my roommates at the time was thinking about trying to raise seed money for a startup or trying to find people to work in his startup, sort of the, both problems were relevant for him. And he found a website called Odesk, which was relatively new, but it was one of the early players in the uh, contracting and gig space. I hired people from Odesk, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, and so he said, you know, this changes everything. Like I have access to talent that I don't have to worry about being poached by other players in Silicon Valley. They typically work at much lower rates than Bay Area engineers. And this would mean that my burn for a startup would be much, much lower than what I would have otherwise planned for. And as a result, you know, I think he ended up going in a different route, but just that early conversation piqued my interest about what the possibilities would be for thinking about new models and plugging in new talent that otherwise wouldn't have had opportunities in the Bay Area labor market uh, to provide those folks with access to that labor market. And it turns out that uh, you can find deep pockets of talent in lots of places globally that used to be inaccessible. And so that's how I kind of started to get interested in this area uh, early on when I was uh, a grad student. So as you studied it recently, what did you see? What did you learn? Well, I'll, I'll maybe take a step back. So I was incredibly bullish on these models for a long time. And as I've watched the space play out, I think if you were to reflect on two different models that would have been available to you as an investor in, let's say, 2010, uh, and I'll, I'll choose 2010 because that's sort of around the Uber launch date, but one model would be that you could have a better taxi that would happen on an app on your phone, or you could hire anyone to do anything anywhere. And it turns out that the better taxi has just blown up and has gotten a lot bigger. And so that's been a puzzle to me. And I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out why we haven't seen more of the, I don't know if you would call it gig or contract or alternative work types of models in enterprise settings or in sort of high skill settings relative to the more commoditized pickup, delivery, uh, et cetera, types of applications where we've really seen this model take off and completely disrupt incumbents in the taxi and delivery space through the Ubers and Lyfts and Grabs of the world. Uh, and so to, I think to circle back to your question, I think that the current models as they existed previously offered a lot of potential but had a couple of difficulties for many of the potential users. And some of those difficulties are internal, like, can you get this through compliance? Can you get this through procurement? Can you get this through HR? And others are maybe a little bit more uh, focused on market design types of questions. Mm -hmm. Like, if you are a busy executive, do you want to see a hundred applicants with spam cover letters to a job that you're trying to fill, or do you want something that's a little bit more bespoke, tailored towards your needs and uh, helpful to drive the right talent to a project or the right opportunities? Mm 
And so I think there are a host of issues that mean that the seamless type of transaction that you expect when you summon an Uber or order Uber for delivery or DoorDash for delivery uh, is not exactly something that we've seen in the higher skilled, more differentiated uh, contractor gig space to this point. And I know a number of players are working on that and are working on the offering. And I think it's an exciting area because we've seen it as a proof of concept in commoditized gig or commoditized other other verticals. Uh, but we haven't exactly seen that movement or that disruption into more traditional modes of working quite yet. It is interesting because you bring up a lot of great points there. We've seen those models work, those on-demand models work, where you've been able to chop up a job into small slices, or you've been able to treat a person perhaps as a cog in a machine, a function perhaps as a cog in a machine, a well-defined large machine. And there's these bits and pieces inside that that need to happen. But you're right, in terms of the more, the bigger things that companies need to do that are strategic, that are uh, core, that might be what they're, they're building that is competitively differentiating them, that's much harder to do, right? That's not something that you can just pick 10 out of an assembly line. That's a little more challenging, correct? Totally agree. And if you think about the history of the corporation, corporations have designed processes that work for them for exactly that purpose. And so disrupting those processes means that you are pushing against a ton of embedded interests to make that machinery as either efficient or bureaucratic, depending on your perspective as possible. <laughs> so we've seen these huge changes over the last decade, and we've seen some of the drivers of that change and new industries develop or be disrupted. Uh, old industries be disrupted by these changes. What did you see during COVID? Uh, did you see some changes with maybe some of the higher end, the the more bespoke, the more the more difficult jobs to do? Um, all of the anecdotes that I have heard from people in this space suggest that COVID was a real differentiator in terms of having a step change around the willingness to use new models. And I think that that probably comes from a couple of factors. The first of which is many more people are now comfortable with remote. And if you don't have to bring someone into your office, it opens up the set of people you're willing to consider for a job. And I think the second kind of core differentiator uh, or the, the core contributor to this sort of step function is that COVID forced digital processes to be adopted quite quickly. And many of the organizations that had to do this probably didn't have the spare talent internally that would enable digital transformation for things that may have eventually gone digital, but would have been two to three to four years out when that needed to happen today. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think for both of those reasons, the comfort with remote and the need to hasten the adoption of digital processes, because so many people were remote, you couldn't do things in the old way anymore. Uh, we've seen quite a, a big increase in enthusiasm around finding talent in new places and utilizing new models as a result. It's amazing because in March of last year, I interviewed the CEO of FIS. Uh, it's a major fintech uh, corporation, 50,000 employees globally. In six weeks, they moved 95% of their workforce to work at home, work remote. That never would have happened ever conceivably without some massive change, some massive burning platform like COVID. This is finance. This is fintech. This is, you know, there, there's legalities involved. There's procedures involved, uh, all layers of fail safes that people don't do the wrong thing. And they moved that massive corporation to homework in six weeks. We saw that all across the world, didn't we? We certainly did. And most of the labor market statistics suggest that this was 
sort of at least uh, a tripling or quadrupling of the rates of remote work relative to what we saw prior to the pandemic. And as a result, to pull that off, you obviously need quite a lot of new things because many of these firms had not planned on this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what's interesting about that is the number of companies that have come out to say that this is going to be our new MO in the future, or at least that we'll see some of these hybrid arrangements in the future. Interestingly enough, you know, Dropbox just sold their office space in San Francisco. And you've seen Quora and other tech companies that said, you know, we used to be in these very expensive spaces in Mountain View or other parts of Silicon Valley, and we no longer need that. Uh, and I think that this forced experimentation meant that some firms or some leaders who didn't think that this would have been possible uh, have now realized that they can pull off different models relative to what they had had experience with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So as part of your research, you looked at what Brain Trust is doing. Uh, it's a new startup doing some interesting things with some significant brands. What did you see there? Uh, how is that model different from other things that you maybe you saw elsewhere? Brain Trust is, you know, an interesting play for a number of reasons. Uh, the first is that I've never seen the crypto type of play that is kind of core to the brain trust offering in this space before. And at first I, to be honest with you, was slightly confused by it mm -hmm. because I didn't think that the crypto it's play itself was going to be, uh, a core differentiator. And then when I heard the founders talk about what their vision for crypto was, I started to understand it. And I think the, the token itself allows them to be much more agile in both providing incentives for both sides of the market to grow the market, but more importantly, it allows them to be agile in terms of experimentation with those incentives. So at baseline, I think that there has been far too little experimentation among many of the incumbent platforms because they're worried about disrupting either supply or demand or some focal point about how they think the market works. But as a result, you end up with solutions that are probably okay on average, but don't work for any of the sort of idiosyncratic big ticket use cases that you might think are important drivers of value. And I think with the, the token experience, you can play around with what the right number of tokens would be to provide incentives, uh, what the right use cases would be for peer evaluation, how to incentivize peer evaluation to improve information in the market. All of these features are features that the Brain Trust founders and executives have spent a lot of time thinking about. But where this differs compared to other offerings is that they can kind of change the prices around, or they can change sort of what the implicit incentive is around because they control this token and it's going to eventually be fungible. But it also means that there's nothing that's exactly like set in stone and mm -hmm. the market can evolve based on what the participants in the market would sort of vote on in terms of how this would work. Or uh, in the early days, they can just run different A-B tests to figure out what actually works well and what doesn't work well, both from an incentives and an operational standpoint. And so that view is pretty exciting to me. Uh, and then the second thing that I have realized over the time that I've been reflecting on what Brain Trust is doing is that their core client and customer base is very different than many of the incumbent players. You know, if you look at the Upworks or the freelancers mm -hmm. or the fibers of the world, I had originally thought that Brain Trust was a play to disrupt uh, or to steal share from those incumbents. And as I reflect on it a bit more, I actually think that's not the target competition. I think the target competition is probably the staffing agencies that are doing things in a manual way that have been set up to serve enterprise clients almost exclusively and that really aren't incredibly transparent both with fees or with lock-in and so there i think if you might 
put the, say, freelancers of the world and the Upworks of the world that were traditionally targeted towards small and medium enterprises at one scale, and those players are trying to move up to larger enterprises uh, compared to Brain Trust. I think Brain Trust is starting at the very, very top and is instead trying to kind of disrupt the staffing space that has traditionally been the channels where contractors or other third parties provide labor to the very largest enterprises. And so my view is now that Brain Trust is really a player that is going to be a more efficient staffing solution that provides transparency to both sides of the market. There's so much uh, to unpack in what you talked about. And I'll start with that part and maybe we'll wind around back to the crypto uh, in a little bit. On the staffing piece, I once hired a guy in San Francisco, paid $50,000 for the privilege to a headhunter agency. And there was a six month um, clause on that. The person had to stay six months for that 50,000 to be paid. Seventh month, he got a $500,000 convertible note from a VC to go build it a company. <laughs> and so we spent a crazy amount of money on an individual for seven months worth of work. And that model, it has serious challenges. It really does have serious challenges. How do you see the brain trust model changing that? I think there are two core pieces with the brain trust model that look different. The first is that everyone in who is a party to the transaction understands what they're getting and what the other party is getting. And that type of opacity with the current staffing models means that there is an incentive to break off these relationships if people get some outside offers because of just the wedge that the staffing industry ultimately ends up taking. And that wedge is 30 or 40% with these big upfront fees. And so I think the ability to drive payments to talent rather than to intermediaries probably means that clients end up with better outcomes. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other uh, piece of this is I think the incentive system ultimately will allow better matches. So one of the other core complaints with many of the staffing offerings is that you get undifferentiated candidates who come from a resume database, but uh, there's quite a lot of burden either to filter many, many people for the privilege of employing them later on, or uh, either matches turn out not to be that great and you cycle through a lot of people. And I think some of the review types of systems that Brain Trust has implemented might be building a better mousetrap in order to actually uh, unearth value and talent that might be harder to observe for large enterprises that need to hire at scale or to hire for very, very specific skills or talents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to hit on the crypto uh, briefly and, and uh, doing so in the knowledge that people don't get necessarily paid in crypto. They get actually paid in US dollars or whatever local currency they get, but there is a crypto component as well. And, and you can get paid in B Trust, uh, which is the token that, that is available. And there's interesting things happening there as well, because as you get B Trust, you gain ownership of the actual entity that is Brain Trust, correct? And some level of involvement in where that platform goes, what it does, what it creates, what it doesn't create, what, what features it has, those sorts of things. You also potentially uh, unlock really interesting possibilities with smart contracts down the future. Um, it's a super interesting play there and, and one that I haven't seen before. Uh, have you? This is the first I've seen of it. You know, I think we've heard a lot of discussion about what smart contracts might look like at scale and other verticals. This is the first time I've seen this in what I might consider the staffing or gig type of vertical where there's a labor component involved. And that, you know, I think is a pretty innovative play mm -hmm. uh, relative to just thinking about the physical transactions of, of goods or monetary instruments or financial instruments. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, 
at first don't think I understood it and it took me a while to get up to speed. But now that I think I understand where the play is coming from and why B Trust is designed the way it is, it seems to be a very, very interesting model. And I can't wait to see what happens in the future because I think at least the hypothesis that this is going to drive quite a lot of value is one that seems plausible to me. Let's talk about incentives. Um, if you have a traditional working arrangement, you've got a company that employs somebody and there's a list of tasks and there's some rewards for that task. And there you go. And you can um, play that arrangement in multiple different ways. If you have a staffing agency, then there's a third party. There's the opacity that you talked about. How does this model of working on a contract basis, getting 100% of that revenue and being closely aligned to that team, but being able to work on other things if you choose, how does that align incentives? Is that better? Is that worse? How, what's different about that? Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm an economist and we, yeah, as economists, we'll always sort of talk about the disincentives of taxes, yes. right? And so you might think of the staffing agency fee as a tax. And so the worker is really the residual claimant on only a portion of their effort or their pay. Uh, and so that incentive alignment is probably pretty important in, in this context. Um, I, I might imagine, however, that there are other aspects that are equally important, including the transparency in terms of what people are willing to pay mm -hmm. and who's getting value out of a particular transaction. And then the, the other thing that strikes me as pretty valuable in terms of incentive alignment is that at least my mental model of who's doing work on brain trust is that many of these people are doing work because they choose to uh, work in a contract capacity. Mm -hmm. And so the, the mechanisms to provide work histories and reviews and things like that also can potentially help to accelerate careers or to uh, provide that next opportunity. And that, that opacity in other contexts that don't have some of these review systems where, you know, you might see that a contractor is reviewed well or poorly if you are the head of a staffing agency, but you're probably not going to provide all of that information to the next client down the line, uh, means that this is also likely to be helpful for people as they supply labor through the, the brain trust uh, platform itself. Talk to me about what you learned about employers. Um, employers typically want as much control as they can get. <laughs> they also want the top talent that they can access. Ultimately, they want to get those things done that make their company better, that make their product better, that make their service better, that grow their brand, grow their revenue. What did you learn from employers who are using brain trust? What are they doing and how's it working for them? There are a couple of recurring themes after interviewing four or five teams who are using brain trust now. Uh, one of those themes is that time to hire has just fallen dramatically relative to an alternative model, either bringing on a full-time equivalent in-house or using a staffing agency. The, the second theme is that the number of people that they're having to evaluate before pulling the trigger to bring someone in has fallen dramatically. And so there's just quite a bit of improvement in terms of matching efficiency. And then I think the other aspect that we've uncovered from interviews is that both time to hire and the ability to find people has improved, but it also seems like on the job processes and collaboration have improved. And the, the folks that we interviewed tended to attribute that to the fact that they have more insight into what people are doing and they're getting better matches. And this is despite the fact that all of this is happening remotely and many of these clients were not sort of remote first uh, mm -hmm. prior to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think on all of those fronts, it looks like some of the early data from enterprises 
looks pretty positive in terms of their experience. How do you see the near-term future as we hopefully exit this pandemic phase? My rough guess, uh, and I'll tell you what I'm basing this guess on in a second. My rough guess is that most workers will go back into some hybrid type of arrangement where there will be a couple core days a month when those folks are expected in the office to interact face to face with others on their team or others throughout the company or that you know that might be one day a week it might be a couple days a month scattered in one week uh it might be some other arrangement but i think that there's still likely to be some face to face component for people who are going to be in kind of enduring full-time roles, but that's a major, major shift relative to what we had before. So prior to the pandemic, under about 10% of the workforce was remote. Uh, I wrote a paper from in the summer that suggested, uh, in the summer of 2020, uh, that suggested that another 16% of the workforce so more than double the pre-pandemic number would be remote at least two days a week. And I think if you revisit that same data that we collected out of surveys today, that number will accelerate because people have become accustomed to remote work. Now, there's a reason that I think that hybrid is going to be the norm, and it's clearly not going to be the norm for everyone. You'll see some companies like Quora that have opted to go fully remote, and you'll see some companies that will call people back to the office. But I think the sweet spot is probably hybrid because it allows people to have some of the flexibility that they've learned to enjoy with remote, but it also will enable some of the tacit in-person learning about teammates that is a little bit harder to do virtually for people who are in enduring relationships. But then if you think about that or what that means for the ability to plug in contractors or the ability to plug in outside talent, those folks will probably find it much easier to plug into teams that are used to operating where the usual MO is somewhat remote rather mm -hmm. than where the usual MO is in-person communication where you go and tap someone on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The surface area of the corporation has increased vastly, hasn't it? Certainly has. Yes. Let's zoom out a little bit more and project out perhaps a little farther. We've talked for decades about the future of the corporation. Uh, we see some crypto fantasies that entire companies will be run by smart contracts. <laughs> we see uh, other models like uh, Tony Shea did, uh, Zappos, Holacracy, right? Um, and, and we see some models in industries like perhaps the movie industry where you know, every major project is this new assembly. Uh, what do you see as the future of the company, of the corporation? Is there some core team that is always amoeba-like, grabbing on to additional capacities as it needs to, releasing them as it doesn't need them? Uh, how do you see the future of the corporation? That's a hard philosophical question. Yes, uh, it is. I'm not giving you the easy ones here. <laughs> let, let me maybe give you what I think of as the short-term evolution, because I think some of the far off smart contracts make this uh, a, a question that is better tailored for the semi near term. And if you compare what I think would be traditional employment relationships, and let's, let's keep it at traditional employment relationships. Uh, I might imagine that there are two forces that are coming from opposite ends of the spectrum that will change traditional employment relationships for some folks. I think most of the commoditized work that is relatively routine, we've already seen being automated and the work that we haven't seen automated, we've seen outsourced. So, you know, if you take a look around my office at Harvard Business School, if I'm ever back in there, <laughs> the landscaping is done by a third party. The cafe is run by a third party. Uh, all of these things are not done by the organization, and that's fairly ubiquitous. And so I think for things that are 
not core, but have a competitive market for service provision, you'll ultimately see that provided by standalone entities that specialize in those types of functions, like the landscaping crew, the kitchen services, the dining, what have you. I think at the other side of the spectrum, you might imagine that there are some things that we don't have comparative uh, expertise in-house to do. Mm -hmm. And there's obviously a question about what you build expertise in-house to do versus what you contract out. And traditionally, the stuff that you built in-house was stuff that you needed a very specific solution and you didn't trust that the, thir the outside market was going to provide that solution. I think now that we're seeing that we're more comfortable with remote work, we're more comfortable with contracting, that the, the line between what's done in-house in a fuller time capacity versus what's done at with a contractor at arm's length or on short-term work arrangements is going to move to where sort of the, the in-house component is smaller. Mm -hmm. My guess is that we will still see some enduring types of jobs uh, in most companies, but that the line is going to get blurred a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that the thing that we do that is core is put on great educational instruction. And there is a set of people who know how to do that. I wouldn't say that it's professors. I would say that there is just a whole organization that has figured out how to do this from a teaching center to a group that does planning for what courses are around to the professors that actually deliver content and vice versa. And that's repeatable. That's something that is routinized. And that's something that, at least for me, took a while to figure out how it works at this institution. And so it wouldn't <laughs> necessarily make sense to have newcomers come in and redesign how we deliver classes every year or every two years, because what we have works and you need people who are familiar with those processes. But if you were thinking about building out a new function in terms of the educational management software that we use, there is no reason that we wouldn't sort of necessarily use contractors to build out that functionality. And so my mental model is basically that the innovative stuff or the stuff that you don't know how to do in-house is going to certainly go out to contractors or the outside market. And so innovation teams and brain trusts are likely to be uh, core together. You'll also probably see a little bit of what was core previously, but isn't so recurring and so specialized, also get moved out to platforms like brain trust where even if it's a core thing, it's not so specialized to an institution that you need to have some in-house person. You can kind of deliver this through the market. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the, the other side, all of the commoditized stuff is probably going to happen through third parties, be it traditional corporations or other arm's length types of solutions. And so on that front, this is sort of more meta than just brain trust and itself, but I, I kind of think that the core of an organization is likely to be shrinking a bit, uh, where the core is just defined as people who are in full-time employment relationships doing jobs that look kind of sticky or like, you know, the jobs that your grandfather would have had where they're in the same place for a long time. <laughs> yes, indeed. I want to turn the lens around a little bit, and we've been talking from the perspective of the employer, which is critical and core, but there's also a perspective of the gig worker, the contractor, the independent business person uh, who is doing the work. How does that change their lives? Uh, I happen to live near Vancouver, Canada, and I employ myself and I do contract work, including for brain trust, which I'm doing right now at this very moment. <laughs> right. And, and, and that's working. That's great for me. But we've also seen workers in the gig economy who are essentially subsidized by, by the public purse because their gig economy job doesn't provide health care, doesn't provide benefits. There's no retirement benefits or anything like that. How does this move forward? And like, I, I'm giving you the easy questions, right? <laughs> How does this move forward in a way that is equitable for workers as well? 
That's a harder question outside of the brain trust model. The brain trust model today has focused on such exceptional talent that you would expect that that talent would earn a premium and they can procure those social safety net, health insurance, uh, retirement benefits on their own through their earnings premium in that model. Mm -hmm. This is a much more difficult question if you're thinking about workers who are at the lower end of the labor market where their alternative would have been a traditional job where the employer would have paid into the benefit system on their behalf, but they're not earning much more as a result. And so, you know, I, I think that where most of the innovation in the space is coming from as a result of the pandemic, some of those safety net types of questions are not likely to be quite as relevant as they were mm -hmm. for many of the pre-pandemic discussions of the gig economy. You know, it, I, I'm not sure how familiar you, you are with AB5, which was a piece of legislation passed in California that was really targeting delivery drivers to try mm -hmm. and bring change their uh, change their worker classification to provide access to safety net measures. I think that this is completely irrelevant for the talent on brain trust that for higher end folks, they have the luxury of being able to procure these measures in terms of retirement savings, health, et cetera, yeah. on their own, so long yeah. as they set their prices, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the high end talent is doing this because they want to freelance uh, or to contract. And so as a result, I, I think that that discussion just looks very different depending on what segment of the labor market you're you're talking about. That makes a ton of sense. Let's turn our eyes towards perhaps your near midterm future. What are you studying next in terms of the future of work and corporations? I have been trying to study the geography of remote work. And I think there's an interesting proposition about what's going to happen to what used to be expensive cities if you can work from anywhere. So there, uh, there are a couple of rationales why people flocked to these cities and why firms paid premiums in the form of higher compensation for people to live in the Bay Area or in New York. And one, one view from the employee side is that these cities are full of amenities. Especially, you know, if you're a young person, it's better to date in New York or San Francisco or L.A. than it is in the middle of the country. You just have a thicker market. But there are also, you know, cultural amenities, restaurants, bars and the like. But if you're talking about the perspective of a company, uh, it seems weird that a company would try to subsidize some of those lifestyle <laughs> amenities. And so. What we have tended to think about in terms of the rationale for why companies wanted people in these areas is that they facilitated knowledge spillovers or firms could access thick labor markets for finding talent, plugging in holes and the like. And if you take away at least one of those rationales, which is sort of the thick labor market rationale, because you can find anyone online to work remotely, there's a question about whether people are going to still have this like focal point around cities as a matching engine for employment purposes. Mm -hmm. And some of the early data from before the pandemic, at least, suggests that remote workers were much, much less likely to be in the 10 most expensive cities in the US, that there were a lot of software engineers in San Francisco, uh, but those software engineers weren't likely to be working remotely. The software engineers who were working remotely were in Salt Lake City or Boise, Idaho, or places that were still uh, medium-sized metro areas, but had a much, much lower cost of living than the, the San Francisco's or the Seattle's or the Boston's of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it's a really fascinating question to think about what the future of cities might be with respect to uh, a large increase in remote work and what that might mean in terms of the management practices that firms need to adopt if the people that you're thinking about hiring are no longer within driving distance of the rest of the team. Uh, and so I think you're starting to see some of that now. I have a friend who's in Salt Lake City 
and is, has been trying to buy a house for the last four or five months and prices there are skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same is true in Boise, Idaho or other places that used to blend amenities with large houses and mm -hmm. the outdoors. And I think we're seeing sort of a reallocation of economic activity to places like that, that you may not have sort of forecast uh, at this time last year. What a fascinating conversation. We could have continued that for hours. If you're interested in checking out Professor Stanton's paper, he'll likely have it on his website at Harvard Business School shortly. And if you're interested in checking out what Brain Trust is doing, either as talent or as an employer, check out usebraintrust.com to get started.